So welcome everyone to this meeting. Um, I'm Vanessa Maydew. I'm communications and knowledge exchange specialist for SEBI Livestock, which is the Center for Supporting Evidence-Based Interventions in Livestock. And SEBI Livestock facilitates the Livestock Data for Decisions Community of Practice, also known as LD4D. So before we get started, a little bit of technical guidance. Next slide, please. Great. Um, so firstly, um, if you don't mind introducing yourselves in the chat. So if you open up the chat, just type your first name, last name, and organization. If you want to say hello, it would be great to hear from you there. Um, you're welcome to keep your video turned on. Uh, we would love to see your faces, but we will keep you on mute until discussions begin. Um, and please use the chat anytime for questions and comments. We will do our best to address these throughout the meeting and we will have designated discussion times. Um, you may also put your hand up to do that. There's a reactions button on the bottom ribbon of the Zoom toolbar or of the Zoom window. If you click that, it has a little happy face. Uh, you can raise hand uh, and you, you can also use the other buttons for fun if you'd like. Uh, later in the meeting, we will use a polling tool called Menti, which is separate from Zoom. Uh, we will explain that later, so just a heads up. So next slide, please. So this is a brief overview of today's meeting. Uh, we have two hours. We're going to do a, an introduction and icebreaker, a look back at the past year. We're going to introduce our brand new theory of change. And then we're going to get into breakout discussions, uh, what we have been calling the Cattle Mart. Uh, it's an innovation showcase. Then we'll have a chat show with a few of our steering committee members and then a wrap up. So with that, I will hand over to LD4D Steering Committee Chair Andrew Bisson for a word of welcome. Over to you, Andrew. Okay, and I hope you can hear me. Um, hello, everybody, uh, and a warm welcome to our annual LD4D uh, community meeting. Uh, my name is Andrew Bisson. I'm a Livestock Advisor with the United States Agency for International Development. And I also have the privilege and the pleasure of chairing the newly formed LD4D Steering Committee. This is the second time that we've had to meet virtually in this format, but it's actually the seventh meeting in the series under the LD4D initiative. Um, for those new to LD4D, the Livestock Data for Decisions was formed in 2017 with the objective to drive better livestock decision-making in lower and middle-income countries through improved data analytics. We're a broad international network, a community of livestock data users and data producers drawn from the public, private, and the voluntary sectors. We recognize in particular the limitations of data in low and middle income countries, and we want to improve this situation through the actions of this network. The LD4D community has grown in the years and is now at about 550 members and still growing. So that's a tremendous achievement. And these people are receiving updates and outdated updates and outputs from, from our work. The community meets and collaborates and shares information to address some of the key livestock data challenges. Okay, next slide, please. The growth of this community has brought a need for greater clarity and purpose. As the, with these 500 members, we have a diverse eclectic interests. And we felt that there was a need to, to sharpen the focus. So to help LD4D to achieve this, to achieve its, its core objectives, the LD4D Steering Committee was established earlier this year. And this has helped the LD4D initiative to, to pause, to reflect on the journey so far, the progress that has been made, and what we wish our future direction of travel to be, to sharpen that focus. And with the work of the Steering Committee and our hardworking colleagues in SEBI, We've helped to identify as a community where, what we want to achieve and how we would like to get there. And with that, I'd like to extend a, 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 thank, a note of gratitude to our hardworking colleagues on the steering committee. Thank you for your advice, your guidance, and your experience and the time that you put in. I think this reflective phase um, sees the LD4D community emerging stronger and looking forward to this next phase. Out of that reflection process, 
we have developed a theory of change and a theory of action, two documents that will help to guide this community over the coming years. We'll hear more about that later. LD4D promotes high quality data, but we also want to renew our emphasis on the users of that data, the decision makers, and the way that they use that data. So we'll take a demand focus as well as looking at high quality data. So the community is now trying to really focus in on who the decision makers are, what are the key decisions that they take, and what are the associated data needs around that decision-making process? Again, this is something that we'll unpack a little bit more later in the meeting. But back to today's meeting. I'm delighted so many people have joined. I think we're getting up near, near 70 now, that's fantastic. I think that breaks the record of the most people at one of these meetings, it's fantastic. I think perhaps one silver lining out of the, the COVID crisis is that so many people are able to join. And I see the, the messages coming in in the chat. We literally have people from all around the world, which is absolutely what we want. So that's fantastic. This meeting should be a great opportunity for you to learn, listen to your colleagues and discuss the work in the community. We'll take a deeper dive in those cattle marts and try and understand some of the intriguing and interesting work that members are, are undertaking. There should be plenty of opportunities to engage and interact. I think we're all getting better at these virtual platforms. Please use the chat uh, function and the various interactive sessions that we have lined up. And with that, I'd like to wish you all a fantastic meeting. I hope you enjoy it. I look forward to it myself very much. And I'll hand back over to Vanessa. Thank you. Hi everyone, thanks very much. So we're gonna do a quick icebreaker. We're going to use a tool called Mentimeter for this session, some of you may know it. Um, so I'd like to ask you to open uh, either a new browser window or even better, use a mobile device, phone or a tablet. Um, go to www.menti.com and enter the code that you see there on your screen, 3866-5304. And when you're in, show me that you're in by clicking the heart button. There we go. There's, that's great. Okay, so we're gonna go through some quick questions to warm us up and get, get to know everyone. Right, there we go. So we're obviously sitting in different parts of the world. What's your weather? Be a few more seconds to respond. Six lucky souls sitting in the sunshine. That's great. Okay, has everyone voted? Okay, three seconds left. Three, two, one. All right, so we've got 21 people shivering in the snow, 12 people looking at a sunny day, and eight people getting their umbrellas out. Good. Okay, next question. Uh, where are you today? So this actually asks you to pin yourself on a map. So move your cursor with your, with your touch screen, touch the place on the map where you are located, and press submit. Hopefully this works for everyone. If it doesn't, don't stress, because it's you won't be marked. Um, okay, there's a big bubble over Scotland. We've got people in Southern Africa, actually, East, North, West Africa. Fantastic. A few, few people in Canada. I think Asia is mostly sleeping, unfortunately. No South America yet, but a big bubble over Europe. Great. So some nice distribution. Yeah, sorry if it doesn't work for you. There's, there's uh, some technical issues around this. Okay, I'm gonna change the slide. So last votes in. Okay, next. So this is a bit more of a serious question. Um, which organization best represents yours? So vote and we'll just have a sense of who's in the room.
big bubble of academics. Great. And if you're other, if you voted other, just type in the chat um, which, which kind of organization you work for. I see eight people who have voted other. Okay. Great. Last vote, four funders, fantastic. All right, next slide. So have you attended before? So we've, I'm sure we've got a big mix. So it'd be great to sort of see who's new and who's an old timer. So the options are newbie, I've attended one, a few, and old timers. So I'll give you a moment. It'd be great if everyone could vote to get a sense of who's here. And remember to, I see some people voting in, uh, in the chat. Um, so it, perhaps the mentee is not working, but uh, just in case you want to give it a try, I'll actually copy the link into the chat and maybe that works for you. So if you open the chat, you can access the mentee that way. So we've got 21 baby chicks, newbies. That's exciting. Um, and then a nice spread of other types of uh, members. Exactly. Great. All right. I think we've got one slide left. Oh, one last chick. <laughs> okay. Last votes in. In one word, if you can, can be two words if you're stuck. Why are you here? And you can enter, I think you can enter more than one. So enter your uh, expectations. Some, some consistent words here, learn, share, collaborate, connect, network, understand user needs, engage, networking is big, learning, curious, this is very interesting, to enjoy, that's a good one. Okay, a few more seconds to get your votes in. So the theme of this meeting was uh, connecting, learning, and sharing. So I, I'm seeing some of those themes repeated in the expectations, which is good. Um, so that's what we hope to achieve. Okay, so that is it. That's the end of the icebreaker. I see there's still some enthusiastic votes coming in. So please do, please do submit your final thoughts. And then I will hand over to Karen for a look back at 2021. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Vanessa. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good evening, um, wherever you are. Um, great to have you all here with us this uh, um, today. Um, so I'm going to start off and give you a bit of an overview of um, 2021, and I will hand over to various colleagues. Um, so just a short overview of the last 12 months. As Andrew has already said, 2021 was really set in the compass and set in our direction for the year, um, the years ahead. Uh, we were delighted to receive um, additional funding at the end of 2020, which means that um, LD4D has security for the next five years. So we're really pleased about that. And it gives us the opportunity to really um, embed LD4D and set our direction for the year ahead. Uh, next slide, please, Gareth. Um, so you've already met Andrew, and he, um, we're, we're delighted that he's chair of the newly formed LD4D Steering Committee. Um, we created this uh, committee back at the springtime this year, really to try and help drive um, LD4D forward and um, make sure that we were on a firm footing for the future. As you can see from this slide, we've got a nice diverse group of individuals, very experienced um, in the area of livestock and data. Um, some of them are well known to LD4D and for those old turkeys, I think um, you put in there, Vanessa, 
um, you, you, you will know them. And uh, there's a couple of new chicks as well. So um, we're, we're delighted to have, um, have um, their participation. Um, Andrew give you a bit of a flavour of what uh, the committee have already started working on. And you'll hear a little bit more about the theory of change after this um, group of presentations. One area that we haven't um, uh, started working on yet, or we've given a little bit of thought to, but we need to give more to in the, in the coming years, is that of the working groups. Um, we had working groups for the last four years. We hope to reinvigorate these um, in the coming year and um, set them on the right track. Um, by and large, um, we we don't they've um, sort of closed off, but one area that is still going strong is that of ontology. And I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Louise Donison, who will give you an update on the ontology working group. Thank you. Um, so as Karen said, um, there's sort of active work with the Tagging Ontologies Working Group, and the aim is to bring together people interested in increasing the reusability of their data so it's fair. But for data to be fair, it needs to be well described, and that raises the questions of what terms, definitions should we use in our community? Um, and to help us answer that question, as a community, we're bringing together livestock data groups and experts in vocabularies and ontologies. And on the slide, we've got a few listed um, to help answer that question, what terms should we use? Um, a concrete output of this group has been a prototype for a tagging tool. And there's a screenshot on the slide to the right. And what the tool lets us do is take content, and in this case from livestockdata.org, and actually match potential tags, descriptions for that content against known standards. And in this case, it was Agrivoc. It's still, the tool is still at its early stages, but we want to bring in more standards and more content with the ultimate aim of identifying terms that are already well described in standards, but actually identify gaps in those standards to then work with the ontology experts to let us define and better describe those content. So that ultimately our data is more usable and much more findable. Thanks very much. And I think I'm handing over to Vanessa. Hi, all. So some of you may have attended our summer learning sessions. Uh, this is a quick recap of what we tried to do. Uh, we ran seven sessions um, inviting members of our community to share what they're working on, their latest innovations. So um, this ran in July and August of this year. Um, a quick summary of who attended. So in total, 554 people attended, uh, sorry, registered to attend, 255 actually attended, um, and that was 162 unique attendees. So some people attended more than one. Um, there was a big representation from UK and Europe, but also from Africa um, and a small group from Asia. So um, we found this to be a really successful endeavor and we hope to replicate it again in the next year. Uh, maybe not a summer session, but maybe called something else. Um, we had a lot of uh, positive feedback and, and people also asking if they could present in future sessions. So uh, thanks to those of you who made this possible. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Thanks. Um, we also launched a new visualization um, as a community effort at the uh, beginning of November. This was a collaboration for the UN Climate Conference, COP26. We mapped 20 innovations which we crowdsourced from around the world, including many LD4D members. Uh, the objective was to show how live, the livestock sector is part of the adaptation solution. Gareth, if you can move the forward a, a click. Um, the map informed wider media outreach as well. So this is a preview of the map. And then if you click again, you'll see uh, we had a piece, there was a piece by one of the people who supports African group of negotiators, George Wamukoya, on why investing in Africa's livestock sector offers best returns for climate resilience. And, and that mentions the map tool in several of the case studies. Um, and if you advance again, um, this has been a really successful output for LD4D. Uh, in the last month, we've had over 1,600 page views um, from all around the world. 
uh, and it was a nice opportunity to connect with new members as well as existing LD for D members. Um, so that's that's our summary of this. Over to Gareth. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, hi everyone. Um, just to cover livestockdata.org, um, since the start of 2021, in this new round of funding, we've had eight thematic updates to the website, um, each of these associated with comms events. And we've seen over 8,300 visitors to the site. Um, the news articles, the events, and the products keep uh, drawing in visitors, old and new. Uh, promotion through the LD4D newsletters and the social media are key in getting those visitors in. Um, the highest proportion of visitors actually come from organic searches. So this is people just using a search engine looking for livestock data. Um, and then of those visitors, 40% spend time exploring more than one page. So they're, 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 visit, they're arriving at the website and then looking at other content on the website, exploring what we've got on there. Um, to date, the products and the events have been linked to key global events um, and largely have been opportunistically supply side driven. Um, if I just move on to the next slide, uh, looking forward to 2022 and the next three years after that, um, the products and events will continue, will continue this timeline, um, annual timeline linking to key global events. Um, and we'll continue with the opportunistic supply driven um, content uh, additions, but we're, but we're hoping, well, we're looking to now review the strategy alongside that of LD4D um, and SEBI to think about how we can become more demand driven. Um, so that's a uh, watch this space, but that's what we're looking forward to doing. Um, we have some increased capacity within SEBI to work on livestockdata.org to give it more uh, time. Um, and we also have a PhD project, which is working on a specific visualization on the website, which is looking at the map of livestock projects and, uh, um, and linking data um, and more information through that, that map, that portal. Um, so that's it for me. I think that's back to, I think I'm now passing on to Annie McLeod. Yeah, that's right. Um, and as a quick introduction, Annie McLeod is a consultant who's been working with SEBI and LD4D uh, on developing a theory of change, and she will explain to us what that means. Hi, everybody. This is going to be an interesting challenge because I'm about to take control of the screen, so hoping the technology will behave. Good. You should, you should have I, ha I have control. Woo. Okay, so why are we working on a theory of change? Well, when the steering committee first met, they very sensibly suggested that the time had come to write down what LD4D was hoping to achieve and the pathway that it was hoping to use to get there. We've had many documents in the past that have describe aspects of what LD40 is up to, but the steering committee said, why not put it all in one place in a theory of change that everyone can easily see? So that's what we have been trying to do. Um, and there are two elements to what we've been writing down. One is a theory of change diagram that puts on one page a very broad summary of the general direction of travel for LD40. And again, thanks to the steering committee for the very sensible suggestion to put it all in one page, because they pointed out that if it's really simple, then it means that people are more likely to look at it and use it. Um, as Andrew's mentioned, we're also working on a theory of action, which is a slightly longer document that will describe in a bit more detail the things that LD4D is actually going to do to put the theory of change into action. And so I'm going to show you both of those. At least I'm going to show you the theory of change today and then try to get some ideas from you about the theory of action. So who has contributed so far? Um, something to um, point out right at the start is that a theory of change is dynamic. 
it's not something you just write down and then stick on a shelf and forget about it for 10 years. As the community evolves, we can expect our theory of change to evolve slightly at, to keep up with events. So what we've got at the moment is a version that was written by the SEBI Secretariat with some helpful guidance from the steering committee. We're going to show it to you and we're going to get a little bit of feedback from you just to make sure we haven't missed out anything absolutely vital. In about a year's time, we will expect to review it with you and see if it needs to change at all. And as I mentioned before, we're going to ask for your ideas to contribute to the theory of action that we are um, putting together as well. Right, so the theory of change diagram that we have here, it is the simplest possible one you can have. It's basically, it will start on the left-hand side and move towards the right. Um, you can have prettier and more complicated diagrams, but in my experience, if you want people to actually read them, you need to keep them quite simple. Um, so starting from the right, the, the general direction in which we're heading is to try to make sure that decision making in the livestock sector is more strongly based on data and evidence than it is at the moment. Um, so that's what we call a development outcome, which is something that we're all interested in and that we can contribute to, but we definitely can't control it. We can just sort of push in that general direction. And we think that it will be important to have two outcomes contributing to that. One being, um, and this is the top box, that decision makers have accessible, relevant, reliable, well-described and timely data. In other words, if the data is good and what they want, they're more likely to use it for decision making. That's kind of a no brainer. Um, and the other thing we'd like to achieve is to make sure that we have a thriving and sustainable community. LD4D has been a really great community. It's growing. We'd like it to be thriving and sustainable so that it can keep on doing what it does, not just for the sake of it, but because it's doing something good. So how do we get there? So then if we go to the left-hand side of the screen, we have the activity and output boxes. Now, those are the things that LD4D directly does and can have some control over. They'll obviously influence by what's going on around us, but these are things that we can really take a bit of control of. So we've got really here that the top, the, the top purple boxes are the things that get us to good data. So we've got stuff here like reviewing the role that data and evidence actually play in decision making so that we have a better understanding of the context in which decisions are made and where people pick up data and evidence and use it you know how that fits in with the other things that they that contribute to this process also identifying some critical challenges which is something that ld4d tries to do pretty much every time it meets um, we're aiming to get towards a prioritised and updated list of what some data challenges are at the moment. And as Cara will tell you at the end, we've got, um, we've got an activity, a consultancy and a partnership that's starting to help us do those, those top two lines. Um, the other thing that we, we do pretty much all the time, all of us, is to test streamlined ways for the, all the various people working on livestock data to collaborate. And we're hoping to move towards some LD4D badge solutions to data and evidence challenges to highlight what all the members of the community are doing and also to put LD4D's badge on some of them. And then something we also do a lot is to engage with the curators of publicly available databases like FAO, members of who are a member of the community and the World Bank, who have representatives here, and OIE, who have representatives, to make sure that we're all moving towards better quality standards and accessibility. So all that stuff at the top is to get us to better data. And then we've got some bits at the bottom, which are to do with creating a thriving community. One is to continue the network building that we have already done, but to reach out to new people so that we have a broader and more diversified community. And one really important part of diversified is going to be to continue to geographically diversify, you know, to, to make that map that um, Vanessa projected from Menti to make that even more populated. And also, um, we think we need to have a look at the gender balance too, to see if we can improve that a bit. And there may be some other kinds of diversification we also need to think about. And 
Um, the Gates Foundation has been um, a wonderful support. In fact, at the moment, pretty much our only support, but that's not very sustainable to rely on one foundation to support you forever. So we're looking towards getting some um, diversified long-term funding. Okay, so underpinning our work, we've identified three different things that seem to be important at the moment. One, of course, is communication because we're a network. We don't all sit in the same place. We have to communicate with each other. Um, and so that's, that always is important. And also always to make sure that we communicate with people who aren't in the network, but are relevant to what we do and interested in the output of what we do. And then two other very topical things that we've put underneath here. One is gender data and evidence, which I think most of us would agree are a good idea, but we're not always sure how to go about that well. So this is going to be a bit of a push for LD4D, we think, over the next year or two. And of course, a very important one, um, we've, just had, we've just had a COP contributing to environmental sustainability by making sure we understand what that's about. So hopefully if this goes on. So this then is a this then is a the overall summary. This is the whole theory of change as it currently stands summarized in one place. And we will um, be giving you a chance to, to have a look at that again later. So we'll we'll give you a place you can go to to look at that. Now, okay. There is one very important underlying assumption. You know, if, if you've got something that starts on the left and moves towards the right, there are usually some assumptions along that pathway. The most important underlying assumption is that data and ev evidence actually do contribute to decision making. Now, I think that's, you know, I think we would pretty much all agree that they do, otherwise, we wouldn't be here. Uh, of course, other things also are very important. Um, the social context, the political context, the economic context, um, all of those things come together with data and evidence to contribute to what we decide to do. But we want to get a bit of an update on where exactly data and evidence fit into that process. And so we've commissioned a study um, to update our knowledge on that process. And again, Cara will come to that towards the end of the meeting. Right, so now back to how you can have an opportunity to contribute. We are going to open up a survey in Survey, survey Monkey, and Vanessa, I think, is going to post this Survey Monkey link into the chat. The survey is going to remain open for 24 hours, so you have a chance to actually get in and think. And the very first thing you'll see when you go into it is, is that um, theory of change diagram in a picture, so you can refresh yourself. Um, and the most important thing we'd like you to tell us about the theory of change diagram itself is have we left out anything that is absolutely critical for LD4D to achieve and that you cannot achieve, it's not shown anywhere in any of those boxes. So um, this is really about, is there something really critical that's been missed out? Because if that's the case, we'll make sure we put it in the next version. And then also to contribute to the theory of action, by letting us know what are the three most important things that you think the LD4D community should do to put the theory of change into action. And the more practical you can be, the better. I mean, we've all got a wonderful wish list, but if you can think of practical stuff, that's great. And of course, because we are all already doing things to contribute, um, if you'd like to let us know about up to three different projects or activities that your organization is already doing that you think will contribute, that's really important. Um, and we are going to give a, in the same way that we used to do at school, if you did a really, really good piece of work, you've got a sticky gold star that you could put on it. So we're gonna give you a sticky gold star if you respond to this. Right, um, I think the, hopefully I'm just going to the chat, yes. And Vanessa has given us a link to respond which hopefully you will be able to get to. Now, if you're very clever, I think you can also use your phone to take a photograph of this little, um, this little blobby thing here and, and get to it that way. Right, so that is um, everything from me at this point. And I am going to hand back to Cara to introduce the next session. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Annie. That was great. So hello, everyone. And just a quick introduction for those that don't know me. My name is Cara Vance, and I am one of the team members of the LD for the Secretariat here at SEBI. And I'm going to be telling you about our next session on the agenda, which we call the Cattle Mart. So for those of you that are new to LD4D, and it was great to see so many new faces actually, the Cattle Mart sessions have become a bit of a tradition at our annual meetings. So similar to an actual market, these sessions provide an opportunity for the community to gather together, to share news on our work over the past year, to learn from each other and to reach out for support. So you might remember when we sent out the invitation uh, to join this meeting that we invited you to share your latest work on data-driven innovations for better decisions. So today I'm really pleased to say that we have 12 community members sharing their innovations at our Cattle Mart session. And if you could just put up the next slide, please, Gareth. Fantastic. So let me just explain how this session is going to work. So as you can see in this slide, the 12 presentations have been divided into three groups, during which time each presenter will talk for around about five minutes. Very shortly, you're going to be invited to join one of those breakout groups of your own choice. So please have a look at the presentations um, on the screen at the minute and have a think about which one of the groups you might like to join. Hello, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to present uh, our digital innovation, which was created within the scope of African Livestock Productivity Health Advancement Program, uh, Alpha Initiative, as we called it, which is co-funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and uh, Zaitis. Uh, I'm, uh, my name is Tanya Mirosinchenko and I'm the presenter. I'm currently the Alpha Initiative uh, lead and the Alpha Initiative, just to remind, uh, it's focused on the three pillars, on the availability of the veterinary medicines and services, laboratory, uh, veterinary laboratory networks and training and education. We work in four sub-Saharan Africa countries, Ethiopia, Nigeria, Tanzania and Uganda. So today I want to present to you the digital innovation lab cards. This digital innovation is actually uh, built on the need um, uh, in the information flow and, and sharing the uh, information fast, uh, simple and uh, free of charge. So the lab cards is a livestock diagnostic application for veterinarians. So the uh, how does it work? So everything starts on the farm and on the farm, so veterinarians can collect the samples. So currently the uh, application works for four species, cattle, uh, poultry, goats, and swine. And uh, samples are being collected, inputted into the uh, system uh, application sent to the laboratory. And everything continues in the lab, of course. Uh, so in the lab, the samples are processed and the information uh, is entered into the um, uh, application. So as soon as the information about samples and the results are entered into the application, they are available for the veterinarian and the um, farm. So of course, uh, you know, having the, all the data in one, one application uh, builds the uh, big opportunity in terms of the data collection and the data processing. So we, we worked to create the uh, reporting and currently we have uh, two platforms where we have the processing and reporting of the information and, and sharing with, with different levels of the customers. So first of all, is the Tableau application for internal reporting. And another one is the uh, uh, lab cards dashboard, which is included into the, um, uh, actually the platform itself. Uh, so 
what can be seen in the uh, data submitted and processed. So there are so several examples I brought here on the um, uh, screen. So first of all, in the Tableau application, well, uh, we, we have the Zetis internal view in terms of the number of the samples submitted per laboratory, per country, per farm. Well, what, which samples were submitted, which species, and whether the samples were positive or negative uh, in case if it's possible to, to reflect in the application. And another dashboard in the lab cards. So in the lab cards, we create a dashboard for actually uh, lab cards users, whether these users are from the uh, lab portal uh, or the you know, internal users or partners, and they have the access to geographical coverage and some KPIs in terms of the users and the uh, species and the samples submitted. So actually the veterinary, uh, you know, the, the lab cards is the part of the uh, broader spectrum of the opportunities where the data can be uh, actually collected, recorded, and also processed for the future. And currently we are working with the lab cards and piloting the vaccination cards, which called the wax cards. So we have more opportunities to build on this uh, same platform, however, of course, we are looking for the partners to actually to make it happen and to ensure that the number of the users will grow uh, from a day to, to another. Uh, of course, with a bigger um, number of the samples, we will see bigger picture, which can be useful for the different purposes for the, uh, you know, broader picture for the international organization for the R&D and other activities. And with this, I want to thank you for uh, for your attention, and I'm open for all the questions when, which can arise. Thank you very much. Hi. Uh, present some cultural production calendar the solution with people in Nigeria. Uh, that's just based on current projects we are doing uh, for now in Nigeria. And that is what informed the development of this uh, CRC uh, digital solution. Uh, this is uh, the content we do not. And uh, this is my profile. Okay, so um, what informed this, uh, the development of this uh, solution uh, it's been said that because of the increased, or let me say, anticipated increase in the number of people living in Nigeria by 2050, uh, to be able to live, uh, feed very well, it should be expected that those people that are tending to animal would want to increase their stock and invest in uh, productivity, enhancing technologies, uh, and that will inform the reason. Uh, the development of uh, the technology around the movement of uh, reproductive performance in how uh, and that technology is actually uh, P4 Good. Uh, so P4 Good test is a rapid 10 minutes progesterone detection test, and we actually use it for that. Uh, so it's a this diagnostic uh, kit, and the principle by which it works is around the progesterone dynamics. So it can be used either for physiological purpose or pathological purpose. And if I say uh, progesterone dynamics, uh, as progesterone is usually high, about 17 days in the estrous cycle of cow, and also found very high during pregnancy, uh, but however, very low uh, during each period. So that's actually the principle by which it works. Uh, all these are the applications of the, uh, the kit uh, for uh, time to prevent this time insemination, prevent insemination of already pregnant cow, uh, to prevent incorrect calving date and mistime dry period to detect silent seed and improve pregnancy diagnosis percentage. Uh, we also use it for some uh, pathological purposes like to help investigate poor fertility and to investigate non cycling kind of persistent corpus luteum and some other more. Uh, so the calendar for reproduction has already been developed in cattle. We are just trying to bring the digital solution to it. 
are using before good uh, tests. So this was developed for Nigeria based on the current project we are doing. So this is an addition phase. And we are hoping to be able to develop it to something that can be used to gather data around the reproductive performance. These are basic features that will be in the solution. Uh, animal unique identification details, reason for before good test, is that physiology or pathology, uh, method of heat detection, before good test result image, official insemination history, the operation, uh, post-carving before good test. And uh, based on all of these tests done and uh, information provided, uh, using artificial intelligence, uh, recommendation will be provided to farmers or the animal health service provider as the case may be. So these are some of the application or uses of uh, this solution uh, to be able to help introduce the concept of productive efficiency in Nigeria uh, to help farmers organize and uh, pastor the performance of the cow. And we're going to be gathering data around the productive performance of cows in Nigeria, productive challenges, application of the reproductive technologies in Nigeria, diseases of reproductive importance in Nigeria, and also fertility in cow in Nigeria. Uh, so what are the next steps? We're hoping that by the time we conclude this project, we'll be able to develop this solution initially using ODK, Microsoft Excel, and Microsoft Access. And then we can also invite UI UX designers to help us design it. And we are hoping to also partner with the company and funders to be able to do the initial stage of this course. That's it, uh, thank you very much. Good day, everybody. My name is Ferdinand Schmidt, representing Casely International from Germany. We are a manufacturer of livestock identification devices and are supplying visual ear tags, ear tags with integrated transponder and tissue sampling ear tags to more than 70 countries worldwide. In this context, we have been working with our partners abroad on various solutions for animal identification and traceability, serving different purposes and requirements. In my presentation today, I want to talk about livestock data and animal identification, registration and traceability systems, the so-called AIRT systems. And I want to review in what way animal identification systems can contribute to better and reliable livestock data. AIRT systems are dynamic with ongoing recording of the active establishments, new animals and respective events. Mature systems can provide up-to-date livestock data with a high accuracy. Here we have already proven examples all over the world. The core functionalities of AIRT systems are related to the registration of an establishment with the owner and the person in charge of the animal. The identification of the animal is always combined with its registration in the central database. The traceability functionality is facilitated by the recording of the movements and all these are the basic functionalities of an AIRT system. Starting from here, we often talk about multi-purpose approaches and here you can see some additional functionalities I came across in my professional working experience. Starting from genetic improvement and animal health purposes, we came across other purposes such as food safety, stock theft, mitigation and loan collateral. However, we do not always have proven examples for the successful implementation and we are lacking experiences on how to do this in detail. What means, what kind of data needs to be recorded and what, what kind of, of events are suitable uh, as a parameter for certain uh, purposes. Here we, I think we need more uh, exchange and it would be useful to also to ask 
this uh, community from the LD4D platform uh, uh, in what way we can share more experiences on this. It is obvious that it is not possible to integrate all the functionalities into one database, but it seems to be an advantage if the system is built on the core functionalities, which are serving as a basis for the extension of the other purposes. In order to do so, the following consideration should be taken into account and can be understood as a prerequisite for multipurposes approaches. These are the unique identification code for establishments and animals across countries, high quality identification devices for the animal's lifetime, defined core functionalities for animal identification, registration and traceability, agreed technical terms in the relevant areas, agreed standards and open interfaces for the data exchange, and an open ICT infrastructure that allows a steadily improvement and extension. Finally, that the participation of public authorities and private stakeholders in one system is also very important because we have a lot of different partners in the, in the value chain uh, for meat and milk, which should be integrated in the system. I hope that this small presentation gave you some more insight to the potential of AIRT systems and I would be happy for more exchange on this on the LD4D platform. Thank you very much for your attention and have a nice day. Welcome everyone on behalf of Sima Remunion team. I am Dr. Abdul Hussain, Senior Area Advisor of Research for Development Project Enhancing Samari Mineral Production to Benefit Farming Families in Punjab. Sindh and Punjab. Uh, this project is funded by um, uh, ACIAR, Australian Center for International Agriculture Research. Today, I am describing the problem of uh, farmers for mortality of the Samari Mineral kids and also introduce the unique techniques to rectify uh, the big problem to, by using the big idea. Our project seeks to improve the livelihood and well-being of uh, men, women, and youth uh, in the Samari Mineral Farming families uh, through more market-oriented uh, production and more effective engagement uh, with the Samari Mineral Valley chain. Uh, we need data to identify where poor productivity exists in the sector so we can uh, uh, target intervention to improve it. Uh, we conducted a wide-scale management and the nutritional resources survey early in the project. Uh, when it was started, some of the key result, uh, uh, results are here from 114 households uh, in the 13 districts across Punjab and the Sin. Uh, the figures are very concerning, showing poor birth and rearing rates and the high mortality. Uh, for example, kid mortality is 19% per annum, and this is an enormous amount of the wastage. This shows a picture of ongoing losses, losses uh, that uh, add up to the an uh, inefficient, uh, unsustainable industry. But we can use this information to address uh, key uh, sector constraint. Now, uh, also uh, we know that from our survey that the farmer has a lot of uh, uh, different kind of the feed resources in their local areas. Next, we will show you how we can use uh, these resources in creep feeding to reduce the mortality. Creep feeding is a method to specifically target ex extra supplementary feed to young kids lambs in the creep area. Improved nutrition is the cost effective way to reduce the mortality and improve in the many circumstances. We also use the local feed resources to make uh, the strategy uh, accessible to the poorer farmer. In this picture, you can see that the, in the normal feeding, uh, there is a high mortality, but creep feeding helps to reduce uh, mortality risk by making uh, young, uh, young animals more resilient. So there is a lot of advantages of creep feeding, but I am describing some of them in front of you. Improved survival of uh, young goats and sheep, cost effective, it prevents uh, feed consumption from older animals that needs it less. It also helps prepare young animals for grazing and weaning. Better grown animals can fetch good 
price of uh, uh, from the market we have intensively collected uh, and data on the effect of the creep feeding but uh, how can information be collected in the areas that do not currently use creep feeding to uh, access whether it is required mere its efficiency we can uh, uh, we can foresee using a quick set of the question about birth death sales and purchases of the young animals in the last 12 months and comparing that uh, to the current number of the estimate losses uh, if they uh, exist uh, this information is more important for farmer uh, themselves and also the industry stakeholder processor buying animals and uh, livestock department to understand where the biggest mortality uh, problem occurs so, so that uh, creep feeding can be targeted where it uh, needed this is an example of our research from Sindh province and animal under traditional management has 29 percent mortality uh, and creep feeding had 12 percent mortality over six months that means the survival of the young goats uh, significantly improved in the creep feed household we have established a workflow uh, to streamline collecting and presenting this information by longitude and weight recording uh, using uh, the software Comcare, importing this data into the Microsoft Excel from the web, creating summary reports uh, uh, in the pivot table. This workflow is semi automated uh, for end users such as uh, extension officers and the government officers, and need wide experience and skills to be able to interpret. Stakeholder uh, monitoring the data and need a good understanding of the production system. Data can be identified where to implement simple and effective intervention to target critical areas of loss in the small order farming. But this information is still need to be interpreted by well-informed stakeholders who can respond to unexpected results and communicate effectively with farmers, especially they have the low literacy and numeracy. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, uh, my name is uh, Dominic Wisser. I work with the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United uh, Nations and I'm going to give you a short overview of uh, a dashboard that we have developed for the GLEAM model. So GLEAM is the Global Livestock Environmental Assessment uh, Model and essentially it's a Tier 2 life cycle assessment tool for greenhouse gas emissions from the livestock sector. And one of the, the challenges we've had in the past is to present uh, the data um, in a meaningful and relevant way from a policy making uh, perspectives because it produces a lot of data, a lot of very detailed data at high spatial resolution and sometimes it's a bit difficult to really look at the data in the right uh, way. So we have developed this uh, dashboard as a means to uh, disseminate data, to subset and filter data, but also to uh, visualize <clears throat> some of our data and, and look at it from different perspectives. So very briefly, we have four domains, uh, animal population, that's uh, mostly uh, based on GLW. We have animal production. Um, we have animal emissions from the livestock sector and then emission intensities that relate emissions to animal products. So I'm going to walk you through very briefly um, animal production uh, population. It starts with key figures for the, uh, in this case, uh, world region. Uh, you can select different uh, regions here and countries, and you can interact with this uh, page uh, by selecting different species, the uh, different herds, and you can see the, uh, in this case, is the number of animals in different uh, production systems. You can also look at the map to see where the animals are and look at different species and get this a spatial uh, representation of the animals. We also have animal products uh, and here you have a, a, an example of a Stanky figure where you can see output from different species. You can uh, look at it in terms of weight or in terms of protein. You can uh, select different animals, different um, Outputs, uh, you can refine this figure further by looking at production system, herd types, and then you get an idea of where products are coming from. You can trace products to their origin. Of course, our key data set is uh, greenhouse gas emissions, 
uh, what you see here is uh, uh, a Senke, another Senke diagram that traces gases to species. Uh, so if you look at methane, we see that methane is generated by all um, animals. We refine this further and look at the source, and we see, of course, it's dominated by enteric fermentation. There's some methane coming from manure. If we trace this further, we see that it's coming from uh, all animals. And in this way, you can refine this figure further. You can immediately see the numbers behind it, and uh, you can trace uh, emissions through the entire uh, life cycle, through the sources, the different herds to the um, animals. Again, there's a map for emissions, um, and you can really interact with this figure and get different different uh, perspectives. Um, from a policy perspective, of course, very interesting is emission intensities. And here you can really compare the intensity or the performance of a, speci a specific system in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. So if we look, for example, uh, in this case, we look at uh, green emission intensity from cattle uh, meat, and this is showing histograms for all countries of emission intensities. And if we look at different production system, clearly uh, feedlots for cattle have the lowest emission intensity, so the lowest emissions per unit of output. And in this way, you can uh, play around, uh, look at different production systems, different products and different uh, species, and really get uh, an idea of differences uh, in terms of global distribution of emission intensities, but also differences in terms of um, production systems. And I think this could be uh, interesting, the most interesting probably from a policy or mitigation uh, uh, perspective. So I should stop here and I would like to have your comments, feedbacks or ideas to look at uh, different or, or to look at the data in other ways um, for things that we might add or might not need um, and any other comments uh, that you might that you might have. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is René Larocque, and I'm a Senior Program Specialist within the Animal Health Team at the International Development Research Centre, which we call IDRC. IDRC is part of Canada's foreign affairs and development efforts. Our focus is that we fund research and innovation within and alongside developing regions to drive global change. Our head office is based in Ottawa, Canada, but we also have regional offices throughout the world. Within the animal health team at IDRC, in collaboration with the UK Department of Health and Social Care, we currently fund the development of innovative veterinary solutions for antimicrobial resistance. This led us to interact with the Global AMR Research and Development Hub to publish the report that I'll be talking to you about today. The Animal Health AMR Research and Development Landscape in LMICs, an Analysis of Funding Patterns. The Global AMR Research and Development Hub was launched in 2018 following a call by G20 leaders to improve coordination and collaboration on global AMR research and development. We collaborated with the Hub using AMR investment data from the Hub's dynamic dashboard, which you can see here on this slide. The goal was to produce a report analyzing the funding patterns of research and development in animal health AMR in low and middle income countries. In publishing this report, our two organizations hope to provide insight in the investment and data gaps to inform the international community and provide evidence to help set future funding priorities in AMR research. Now I would like to present a few of the major findings from uh, the report. According, according to the Global AMR Research and development hubs dynamic dashboard recorded animal health funding comprises only 11% of the 8.991 billion US dollars in AMR research and development funding since 2017. 
As a share of the animal health research investment included in the database, less than one-third involves low- and middle-income countries, amounting to 301 million U.S. dollars since 2017. And in addition, less than 1% involves animal health research and development funding going directly to low- and middle-income countries. Now we wanted to present to you the major funders of animal health AMR research and development funding. What we found is that almost three quarters of all the funding in animal health AMR research and development in the dynamic dashboard is by funding institutions based in the United Kingdom, as you can see here with 72% of the funding. Other countries from which Mo from which the most funding originate includes the United States, China, the Euro European Union, Japan, and Canada, which together make up to nine of make up 95% of all the funding in this space. Most investments in animal health AMR research and development in the database are made by public institutions, that is 97% of them, and the remaining is funded by private nonprofit organization or by joint public-private initiatives based in high-income countries. The investments in animal health AMR research and development contained in the database are considered to involve low- and middle-income countries in three different ways. The first way is through Type 1 investments, and that means that the funding institution is based in L an LMIC and the research organization is based in the same country. Type 2 investments is where the funding institution is based in a high-income country and the lead research organization is based in a low- and middle-income countries. And finally, the last type of investment, which we call the type three investments, is where both the funding institution and the research organization are based in high income countries, and the research is relevant for at least one specified at MIC, has an LMIC based partner institution, or takes place in an LMIC. As you can see from the graph, we definitely uh, can see that type three investment is the most common way uh, that we were able to identify fundings that includes or that incorporates uh, LMIC in any type of way. So rapidly, I wanted to present some of the takeaway message from our report. The first one being that funding for animal health in AMR research and development is very concentrated. However, AMR and animal production is a global issue and therefore it's risky to have funding only come from a few sources. China and Brazil are actively uh, funding in animal health AMR and research and development and therefore there's opportunities to actively involve them in various AMR initiatives. Very little funding is going directly to LMIC research organization, which uh, limits their ability to contribute to local agenda and generate locally relevant knowledge. AMR research and development in the aquaculture sector is relatively underfunded. However, it is a rapid growing subsector and there's many more species produced than land-based production and therefore uh, inherent risk of water contamination. And finally, there is little data on research funding for how gender and social and economic factor links with animal health and AMR, but we feel that more data is needed to determine whether this type of research is being funded and what is actually needed. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Yin Li. I'm working for CSIO in Australia. I'm very glad to have this opportunity to share with you our work on global livestock biomass and value estimation for GBAS. So GBAT is a program that provides information for evidence-based investment plans for veterinary services. The program will benefit allocation of resources to key social, economic, and environmental problems. I'm working for the PPS team. We are collecting information on the input and output relationship of livestock production, including livestock biomass and economic investment. The livestock biomass and economic investment analysis will be the basis for estimating the health loss enveloped due to disease and other health problems. And also accurate 
biomass estimation is important for improved accuracy of greenhouse gas calculation. We used the different ways of estimating global livestock biomass for major animal species. We got very different values, but similar trend. In terms of the contribution from different species, as you can see on the graph at the right side, cattle and chicken are the most important ones. They also contribute the most of the global livestock biomass increase along the years. Livestock biomass was not evenly distributed between countries. The graph on the left shows the top countries, including Brazil, China, the United States, India, Argentina, and Pakistan. But uh, be aware that China and India also have the biggest human populations. The other graph shows the position of the other countries after excluding these top ones. It seems that uh, the Asian, Asian countries, which are indicated in dark green, tend to have lower livestock biomass per capita, while American countries in olive green tend to have higher livestock biomass per capita. We also estimate the global economic value for farmed animals using the data set from FASTA and FAO's Fishery and Agriculture Division. The result for 2018 shows the value and the proportions of total value by different species. We will also assess global distribution of the value, as you can see here, at the global map. Please be aware these values can be an underestimate of the true values due to the data gaps, and this work is still in progress. While working on these meaningful outputs, we are facing several significant data gaps, including the livestock population by different production systems and the cost of the production, including VAT and uh, facilities investment. The other data cap is the, the quantities and the values for uh, some species and countries. For example, there's no quantities for fish stocks for global analysis. And for India, there's no farm gate price data for live animals. So please contact if you are aware of any potential useful data size, data sources for GBAS. Thank you very much for your time. Good afternoon. My name is Renee Cardinals, and I'm a PhD candidate at Wageningen University in the Netherlands. In our research group, we look into the potential of circular food systems, mainly the env environmental ben benefits of closing nutrient loops in the agriculture production phase. For example, by feeding waste streams and leftovers to livestock, or by using human excreta as fertilizer. But today I will talk to you about an important step in our research, which is the collection of data, and in this case, specifically the collection of data on animal production systems. Because in order to redesign food systems, in our case into circular food systems, we need to have reference data. With other words, we need to be able to assess the current situation to know how we should move forward. However, we noticed that specific uh, animal production data is often not available, not complete, not accessible or not up to date. Therefore, we decided to start collecting this data ourselves with the aim to eventually make an open access database with animal production data that scientists from all over the world can access. Now, many people have already come to us with the notification that such a database already exists, uh, which is namely the FAO STAT database. Um, we are aware of the data that is included there, but we have also noticed that there are some inconsistencies as well as some important data lacking. For example, data that is not included are specific details on animal feed. What are animals fed around the world and what do they produce on this feed intake? Uh, and also very important, where does the feed come from? 
uh, feed can be the largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions in livestock production, and therefore it's very valuable to know what the source of the feed is. So we started with the idea to develop a comprehensive online questionnaire that we could spread among scientists and other stakeholders worldwide. We collected contact details from scientists from ResearchGate and complemented this with our own network. Besides that, we aim to team up with institut institutions or initiatives that are interested in the same data collection. As a next step, we also want to connect to national statistics centers. This is a quick overview of how the questionnaire looks like. Uh, anyone entering it will be led through a range of questions by which they can share their knowledge on an animal production system of their expertise. Simply by answering these questions, they provide us with the knowledge that they have on the animal production system. So far, we've received over 700 responses from all over the world. And also, we rounded up a fair amount of ambassadors who are willing to help collecting the data further. However, you can imagine that this is by far not enough for a database covering production data from all over the world. Um, so therefore, we intend to further collect data in a more proactive way by, for example, reaching out to national statistics centers and organizations. As you can see, it's quite a big initiative and we will not be able to manage this all by ourselves. Uh, we need the support of other institutions that also see the importance of what we're doing. Um, examples of how others can help are by sharing the data that they have, uh, either through the questionnaire or by contacting us directly. It would be very helpful if the initiative is spread, and we have made this relatively easy by providing a press toolkit on our website that contains ready-to-use tweets, uh, an infographic, video, and more stuff. Lastly, we're also looking... Oh, sorry. Lastly, we're also looking for institutions that are willing to house our MSc students uh, for the project of collecting data, because Wageningen University is not allowed to host their own students. So thank you for your attention uh, and interest. I will put a direct link of the questionnaire in the chat and uh, feel free to reach out to us with any questions or for collaboration. Hi everyone, I'm Donald Moore. I'm the executive director of the Global Dairy Platform, and I'd like to talk to you today about some of the work that's going on in the area of sustainability in the dairy world and how we're using data and tools to inform that work. Recognizing the importance of sustainability to the dairy world, back in 2013, we launched the Dairy Sustainability Framework to allow us to track, monitor, and report on progress on sustainability in dairying worldwide. We have got 11 um, global criteria that we track and those criteria cover social, economic and environmental outcomes. And each year we produce this report. You can access it at uh, the Dairy Sustainability Framework org website. We produce this report which tracks the progress against those 11 criteria. But what I wanted to point out particularly today is the way in which we uh, in the dairy sector have prioritized those 11 criteria. So this is the prioritization of the 240 billion liters of milk in the world that's reporting through it. And the number one prioritized criteria across all those organizations is greenhouse gas emission reduction. And that led us in 2019 to work with FAO to produce this report about climate change and the global dairy cattle sector. The report covers the period from 2005 to 2010 to 2015. And it's given us insight into areas in which we need to work more. So along the bottom here, I'm saying it's the data and analysis led to insights, which led to understanding, which ultimately have resulted in actions, direct actions within the dairy industry. And that led us to launch the Pathways to Dairy Net Zero Initiative in September of this year. This is an initiative that is um, formed by six organizations, ourselves being one of them. And we work very, very closely in partnership with the Global Research Alliance on Agricultural Greenhouse Gases as our knowledge partner. And I would be remiss if I didn't also recognize the important role that FAO has played 
in the leadership of this initiative. What are we trying to do here? Well, we're trying to raise the ambition of the global dairy sector to tackle climate change. Now we know from the report that we did with FAO that some 70 to 80% of greenhouse gas emissions in the dairy sector come from the developing world. So what can we do to raise ambitions globally? Well, we want to enhance or introduce uh, climate action right across the global dairy sector. We can't reduce greenhouse gas emissions at the risk of biodiversity, nor can we risk nutritional security, livelihoods, economic growth, or indeed animal care. So it's a complex problem to solve. And the way in which we want to do that is by understanding and analyzing the different farm system topologies all over the world. And for each of those topologies, then building out pathways that look at the different mitigation um, techniques that can be applied and optimizes them for each of those pathways. Since launching in September, we've already got over 80 organizations signed on to support or implement the, the Pathways to Dairy Net Zero program. And we'd encourage you to consider joining us as well, which you can do at pathways to dairy net zero.org. But what I wanted to take the last few moments and talk to you about was really some fascinating research that's coming out. Now, a lot of this research at this stage is still based on generic analysis and generic models. And so we need to dig deeper into the specifics of different farm systems. But this plot that you've probably seen before looks at greenhouse gas emissions relative to output. So um, output per cow versus GHG emissions per kilogram produced. And if we look at sort of six generic um, atypical um, systems around the world, starting on the left hand side with those low yielding high GHG emission systems per yield, which we tend to classify as perhaps agro pastoral or pastoral or smallholder dual purpose systems. And then along to the other side of the graph on the right hand side where you're seeing those high input high output systems. But this is the bit that's new. And this is just straight out of um, most recent analysis using the GLEAM model against these different topologies. And what's fascinating here is now our ability to see where the different emissions are coming in those, where the emissions are coming from those different farming systems. And so at the pastoral, agro-pastoral end of the scale, it really is about enteric fermentation uh, as probably the key key to unlocking uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions, where on the opposite end of the scale and those high input, high output, you'll notice that manure management becomes much more of an issue than in, in other systems. And that then allows us to look at what are the, the key mitigation options that are available to us. But I guess a lot of this is based upon, um, you know, a generic understanding of those different systems. And we've really got to get the data to back um, the more detailed analysis of farm system topologies around the world. And once we have that, we can then look at modeling these different mitigation options per system. So what's next for us? Well, I think one of the key challenges that we see in this is we want to base our, our decisions on the information that's available to us. However, at this stage, a lot of that data is somewhat dated. And so we need to find ways to make our data more accessible in real time. Um, and we need to look for what other sources of data that may be available to us, whether it's emerging technologies like satellite imagery or blockchain. Um, and we also have to be able to disaggregate the data to get down to that localized level so we can make localized decisions. On the tools side, I've mentioned Gleam a few times. Now that we see the power that is in the GLEAM model, we need to work to make it more robust, industrialized, as I often say, and more accessible so that people can, are able to use it. For models like that, there are often rules built into them, and we need to make sure that there is greater transparency around those rules, such as on allocation. We also need to make sure that our models are able to look forward as well as back. And maybe that's more a question on data because a lot of our data is so dated, it's looking backwards, but we need to be able to, um, um, to consider what the future looking um, profiles will be. So doing what if analysis with them. And we need to make sure that those models are flexible for changing conditions and priorities. And with that, I thank you for your time today and I wish you good luck in your meeting. Bye.
Hello, my name is Alan Duncan. I'm at the Global Academy of Agriculture and Food Security at the University of Edinburgh and also at ILRI. And I'm happy to be talking to you today about the Jamil Observatory for Food Security Early Action. So probably easiest to start with the vision. Uh, the vision of the observatory is through early action, forecasting and preparedness, vulnerable pastoral and agro-pastoral communities in East Africa are food and nutrition secure in the face of climate change now and in the future. So as you can see, the observatory is about uh, early action. It's about forecasting oncoming food shocks, being prepared for them and acting in advance of them. And I'll describe how we uh, achieve that in, um, in the rest of this talk. So what's the opportunity? It's um, partly around harnessing advances in earth observation and data science. Um, so using new tech, but it's not just about new tech, it's about applying uh, those innovations in real life decision making situations uh, in order to achieve outcomes. So it's about a combination of uh, digital technologies, but engaging um, with communities, both pastoral communities, but also with the stakeholder community in East Africa in order to achieve progress. And finally, it's about research. So it's about mobilizing the research that needs to be done um, and connecting that research with on the ground communities, pastoral communities, but also the wider stakeholder community. So what are we? Well, at the moment we've recently launched. We launched a COP26. Um, we're really at the moment a consortium of partners with complementary capabilities. And at core, we see ourselves as an innovation lab um, that seeks to stimulate research and action based on the expressed needs of local actors. Who are we? Uh, we're the University of Edinburgh who convened the observatory and bring expertise in earth observation, data science and digital education. ILRI, our, our um, presence in East Africa, uh, we're in the process of recruiting a head of the observatory who will be based with ILRI in Nairobi. Um, ILRI have uh, a long history of applied livestock and climate change research in dryland and pastoral areas. Save the Children are a humanitarian NGO, also grounded, present in East Africa, applying forecast based action approaches and tools. JPAL, um, Jamil Poverty Action Lab, are our evaluation partner, bringing expertise in RCTs and uh, robust evaluation methods. And Community Jamil, um, bring a whole lot of uh, influence, a wide network of, um, of stakeholders and a history of investing across education, health and climate um, and investing in evidence based policy making. So that's the, the consortium. And just finally looking at our our model. Um, we are new, we're evolving, we're still working this out, but at core we see the observatory being based around a community of practice of, of local stakeholders, uh, regional stakeholders in East Africa. Um, we have a first community of practice face to face meeting in Nairobi in late January. And a key element of that meeting will be distilling some challenge questions um, from through dialogue with uh, existing stakeholders, um, things which gaps in in knowledge, things that research can bring to this space. Um, undergoing a series of some kind of distillation process to prioritize those uh, challenge questions, disseminating them to a wider network, establishing consortia, uh, developing research projects, be it PhD projects, postdoctoral projects, or or short short term um, consortium type projects. Those would interface again with uh, the community of practice with a view to developing options and solutions and delivering impact. So 
So our ask for you is to keep an eye on us, um, suggest challenge questions if you have them, offer your expertise, keep in touch on email, reach out to me um, or through this email address. Thank you very much. Thank you. My presentation is titled A Data Culture and Big Data Capacity Building for Animal Sciences in Sub-Saharan Africa. My name is Saidu Oseni, a professor of animal breeding and the director of university research at Bafemi Awolowo University, Ileife, Nigeria. As part of the outline for this uh, presentation, we have a brief outline for this presentation that covers the background to data culture and big data capacity building in animal sciences, some gaps, the rationale for and justification for this proposal, goals, strategy, outcomes and deliverables, risk, and then conclusion. As part of the background, we know that there has been a major upsurge in the application of big data analytics for value creation in the livestock industry. And we know that through analytics, we can monitor trends and patterns regarding the complex phenomenon uh, facing all aspects of livestock production and value chains. The sound data culture is tied to value creation and enterprise development in the livestock industry. In the Department of Animal Sciences globally and in Africa, there is the possibility of accumulating mega data sets over time through multiple avenues including our supervision of students across BSc, MSc, and PhD degrees, funded research, metadata, and supplementary data from all the sources listed on the screen. So our focus is on the departments of animal sciences in universities in sub-Saharan Africa. The gaps are as listed. We're aware that there are no institutional mechanisms for accumulating and harnessing livestock data assets to drive innovations in the livestock industry. There's really no framework for ICT-driven data capture, archiving and management, analysis, intelligence and insights for value creation and enterprise development. All these gaps are well known. More importantly, we know that there are no data cultures in these academic departments in sub-Saharan Africa. And consequently, these departments run or face an existential threat and the risk of going moribund. That is the principal issue addressed by this proposal. As part of the rationale and justification, we know that knowledge, skills, and competencies in data intelligence inspire professionalism in animal sciences, and that a sound data culture is in harmony with global best practices in training and capacity building in animal sciences, and that data analytics and data literacy are critical skills for graduate employability and future career prospects. And th again, this is the focus of this uh, presentation. The main goal or aim is to establish data culture across animal sciences departments in sub-Saharan Africa. And as a result, build capacity for big data analytics and exploration for value creation along the livestock value chain. And then the specific objectives are as listed, built around the main aims and uh, objectives. As part of the strategy, we need institutional buy-in as a critical starting point, and then we need to build skills and competencies that are tied to ICT, e.g. ICT moderated experimental design, data capture, archiving, management, ETC, as well as new courses to drive the data literacy and competencies. We also know that as part of the strategy, we need to establish data infrastructure as illustrated in in uh, figure one, and that this data infrastructure encompasses hardware and software components uh, for the animal science data program. All the details are included. We have the infrastructure that captures data repositories across the sub-specializations in animal sciences, data warehouse, data intelligence, and, as well as the channelization of the intelligence to different stakeholders as beneficiaries. The special considerations is also given to teaching challenges, including institutional buy-in, funding, sustainability, other risks, and then a program to address or mitigate these risks. As part of the outcomes and deliverables, we have functional data culture labs in animal sciences, 
knowledge and insights from data in all specializations in animal sciences, data enabled ICD processes and applications to drive innovations in livestock farming and all the others as listed. As part of the outcomes too, outcomes cover individual faculty, students and institutions. On the part of the faculty, you have scientific ability is enhanced, career growth development and overall successes are boosted, and then there's higher quality of teaching and supervision as well as overall professionalism and a legacy as a scientist. For the students, we have higher motivation and inspiration with new competencies in data skills and competitiveness. Careers and career progression and career options are boosted and ultimately higher professionalism in animal sciences. For the institution, ultimately there will be data culture extended across all disciplines and colleges and this may contribute to higher visibility and enhanced global ranking of this institution. Some reflections. The whole overriding or overarching goal for this presentation is to address the data culture deficit as an existential issue for animal sciences in sub-Saharan Africa. And the need for data infrastructure and capacity building for big data for animal sciences as an imperative and urgent matter. Ultimately, to have enhanced monitoring of key performance indicators and benchmarks in livestock productivity and value chains, and to boost professionalism in animal sciences as well as graduate employability through competencies in big data analytics and insights and intelligence. My appreciation to LD4D for addressing a critical gap in this uh, regard. Uh, thank you very much. Hi, my name is Michael Victor, and I'm the Head of Communications and Knowledge Management at the International Livestock Research Institute and Principal and Guest Investigator for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation funded project on advancing uh, investment in sustainable and equitable livestock systems, or what we call GLAD. And today I'm going to provide you some lessons on how we use evidence and data for advocacy, as well as tell you a bit about GLAD and how you can get involved. Uh, so GLAD was started in 2016, and it's currently in its second phase, and will hopefully be going to a third phase uh, in 2022. Uh, inadequate funding for sustainable livestock systems really inspires this program. Uh, and as we all know, livestock systems are, you know, really of increasing relevance at, to some of the world's most critical global challenges, from food security to environmental degradation and the climate crisis itself. Uh, and, you know, really investments in sustainable livestock systems and developing countries do not match the potential of livestock contribute to sustainable development uh, and its potential. So in the longer term, what we're really trying to do with GLAD is to not only grow the financial and policy support, but also the intellectual or the discourse around uh, sustainable livestock. Uh, to ensure and to show how it is uh, linking to su the sustainable development agenda. And we do this by uh, producing compelling evidence that is well communicated through targeted engagements to influence different decision makers. And as you can see, these are our primary target groups. We're looking at uh, global and bilateral and investor agencies to really grow the uh, financial side of things. We're also trying to engage with national and regional planners and strategists uh, at the local level, uh, and then also engaging to kind of change the discourse and show the benefits of sustainable uh, of, of livestock systems uh, for sustainable development in areas beyond processes beyond livestock. So the UNFFFS or the Commu uh, Committee for Food Security or the World Economic Forum. And we also really target livestock champions and the livestock lonely uh, that we call the livestock lonely who are, uh, you know, kind of livestock champions in different organizations and investor agencies. Uh, so just briefly, we have four interventions that kind of lead to a logical pathway, hopefully for change. And that's really kind of first developing and synthesizing and assembling the evidence that we have to make sure that the messages that we're producing uh, are evidence-based and based upon the science that we have at ILRI and also increasingly in other places and other organizations as well. Uh, then we communicate that in innovative uh, products that really uh, are uh, targeted for different target audiences. 
Uh, and we try to influence different investment choices by, uh, you know, whether that's at the global, regional, or national level. And, and then we try to engage with these coalitions of livestock champions. So that's kind of the, the kind of key intervention approaches that we have. And I'm just going to show you an example of how we've done that. Uh, most recently, uh, for COP26, where we focused on uh, climate resilience and adaptation. So we did this with live, uh, a partner, a uh, group of partners, Livestock uh, Data for Development, uh, CTGLH, uh, the University of Edinburgh, uh, and SEBI. And the purpose was really to highlight livestock as a climate solution rather than a climate problem. Uh, we had more than 30 case studies, but then 20 we selected to, to highlight. Uh, and these were visualized through an interactive map. Uh, but we didn't just stop at the map, we created a campaign and an engagement process to use these in different uh, fora and different activities within the, uh, within the COP26. And we had the case studies, but we also had a social media campaign that was one crisis and shared solutions. Uh, we also created some human-based messaging to really show the face of some of these case studies. And then we had an op-ed that really made the case for why investing in livestock in Africa could really support uh, climate resilience and offered one of the best returns. Uh, and then we saw from this, uh, from the case studies, that there is a great potential for livestock to contribute to climate resilience, but it has to be framed in a different way. And this is something that the African uh, negotiators brought up a lot as well. Uh, so some of the lessons learned over the last couple of years that we've had, uh, are really that evidence alone doesn't lead to change. We need engagement, we need targeted dissemination, and we also have to show the human face of things. We need to test our messages, uh, and we need to link this into the wider development narratives and not just focus on livestock for livestock's sake, but, uh, sake, but how it contributes to sustainable development. We know this is process intensive. It takes a lot of time to get the right messages, to find the appropriate spaces, and then identify the champions. Uh, and this is what we want to do in our next phase is really extend and enrich the network of ambassadors and champions that we have from different worlds, not only from the sustainable livestock side, uh, but from other uh, development uh, uh, sectors. Uh, so finally, just really quickly, uh, GLAD will be uh, focusing on a, another phase. We're starting to develop that and we'd like to get you involved. Uh, we're going to continue to develop a global narrative uh, on the importance of livestock for sustainable development in low and middle income countries, but we really want to have focus on targeted uh, narratives and priorities that will form the basis for the partnerships that we develop. And we want to leverage partnerships and champions from across GLAD and the LD40 network. And finally, we're going to be moving the GLAD COP from a knowledge network to more of a brokering of investable solutions. So we uh, really look forward uh, for you to get involved and please do contact us if you're interested. Uh, and that's it. Thank you very much. Welcome back everyone. See you slowly re-emerging from the breakout discussions. So we'll give you a few moments to settle back in. If you need to, at any time, uh, grab a glass of water, take a quick break, obviously you can just do that. Great, I think we are all here. So our next uh, item is a, a chat show with uh, three respondents who happen to be on our steering committee. So I'll ask uh, them all to make themselves known, turn their video on and unmute, and Annie will be leading this session. So I, I will hand over to you, Annie. Great, thank you, Vanessa. Well, I, in group two, we certainly had four very interesting presentations. I'm sure the other groups also had the same. Um, so now we have our three um, heroic reporters back who are going to give us some of their reflections from their own groups. Um, welcome back, everybody. As well, I'm glad to see that you're all, st all still with us. Could I ask, what I'm going to do is to ask each of the respondents in turn to give us the reflections that they want to, hopefully based on the questions we posed, but no doubt they will have their own thoughts as well. Um, 
Isabel, since you were with group one, would you be willing to start us off with your reflections? Thanks so much for, for that. How much time do I have? Uh, <laughs> just as a... Right, okay, but, just just two or three minutes, if that's, that's okay. Right. Great. Absolutely. So uh, thanks, group, group one. It was uh, a very inspiring discussion, I think, where we uh, we uh, we focus on solutions at farm level, and it was we cover um, new innovation innovations in terms of uh, feeding practices to reduce uh, kid mortality in, in in Pakistan. We as well discussed a kind of a co-pregnancy detection uh, app uh, systems uh, to uh, to be used, and uh, we discussed uh, animal traceability. And as well as uh, the last one was um, about how could uh, we better streamline data on animal health at, at farm level. So uh, really, really great in innovations and uh, the kind of discussion that came out from, from that is that many people have tried similar things, were interested in knowing more about the data. Uh, how, how does it work? Have you tried that way? Have you tried this way? What about local context? How do you make it work in local context? I think that came out very strongly. And as well, very importantly for me as an economist is who's going to pay for all this? Uh, what, is, what is the cost? How, how do we then sustain, uh, sustain those systems? There was a few questions about, about, about that. So what I found uh, really interesting as well in this group is was um, these really similar interventions uh, done in different places uh, across species. And that made me think about how can we better kind of coordinate those kinds of efforts, right? Assessing, you know, who does, who works on, on those, on those uh, animal health app, for example, and how can we learn from each other in a more concerted manner so that you have the data um, we, we accumulate the data, or we get data which are better coordinated, better structured, more robust, possibly, uh, to to uh, to drive uh, to draw some uh, some stronger decisions. Um, what I was as well thinking, possibly, that because it was it was a topic and the time it was not there, it was very much technology focused. And uh, you know, I'm trying to say, how can we move from being technology focused to more like client focused, customer focused, right? Because at the end of the day, somebody will have to decide, yes, I want that product, I want to invest into it. Um, so that that is something that um, I was thinking as we are listening to those great presentations, and and very importantly, we discuss context in terms of you know. In some communities, community, communities, people don't like having um, ear, ear tags to the animals for cultural reasons. So the context is very important. And then I was thinking on gender, obviously, right? Uh, how do those, those solutions work for different uh, for different segments of the population, for men and women differently, for youth as well, for pastoral versus more mixed mixed crop livestock systems. So. All that I think uh, was in when my was in my mind, and then as usual, right? We talk about successes when things work, and <laughs> it's like I'm a book. I really would like to hear more about failures. Why, why are things not working? We tried something, it failed. Okay, we can learn so much from failures as well. But yeah, I think for a starting point, I hope that's enough for me. And uh, great, great, great chat and great, um, uh, great discussion in group one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Isabel. And something that really struck me when you were talking was that the group that you're with is probably the group out of them all that, that has potentially very direct contact with the people who can um, who can show their demand. Um, that and that's that's a very that's a an interesting group from that perspective. I'm going to move on to group two. That was Ulf, and that was a group that I was in, which was looking at a very different kind of. Um, database so over to you all for your yeah, reflections uh, th th thank you and yeah we were talking about uh, global data uh, we had uh, four and I, I want to say that that it was not discussed but it was very professional uh, presentations and nicely put together by by the CB team I appreciate that uh, and um, it, it was one uh, from, from uh, Dominic from FAO and Gliam, uh, data on uh, production and emissions. And so it was a super friendly, user friendly uh, tool, if I put it like that. Uh, it's not released yet. And uh, so, so, but it was really, really nice. And then we had uh, from, from uh, Rene about uh, 
IDRC uh, from, from Canada about uh, funding for uh, research on uh, in low and middle income countries on, on AMR, uh, which was kind of, uh, I, I would say, heroic uh, attempt to, to, to put, put together. I could guess it is it's really hard to, to dig, dig after this, um, this data. And then we had from uh, Jin Lin from CSRO in Australia about the uh, GBAD, uh, Global Burden of Animal Diseases. And uh, what struck me there, I think, was um, that he, 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 he really acknowledged or was very transparent about the sh shortcomings in his data or the gaps. Uh, and then we had from our un other Rene uh, from uh, Wageningen, um, about uh, uh, a, a collection of production data and production system with the aim to understand the circular uh, uh, economy in the sense of, of, of livestock. Um, what, what, what we discussed, I, I think there were three things. Uh, we, Annie and I had a, a slightly provocative question uh, whether this was what, what is the demand for the things you are doing? Uh, and uh, uh, needless to say, uh, everyone could justify it very well. Uh, and and uh, it's, it's not obvious maybe always from the very beginning, it, you can create a demand as, as, as well. Uh, and then we talked a lot in the, on the methodological aspect, the data sources, uh, how, how reliable are, are, are the data in a uh, lot of things are modeling, extrapolating, and, and so, and, uh, so and, and we talked about uncertainty in, in data to, uh, to be honest in that, like a IPCC are, uh, and to do this in a, in a consistent way, so it's not ad hoc uh, C and so, but that long, it's long in, in, in the future, but I, I think it was a strong consensus about these methodological uh, challenges. I stop there. Thank you very much, Ulf. And I think one of the, one of the points that certainly emerged in that session was um, that LD4D is a great place for people who are working on these global initiatives, at least to talk to each other about the definitions they use and how consistent they are. And that seems to be something that is, is certainly valued. Um, right, so then uh, Shannon, I think you were with group three. Would you mind giving us your reflections on group three? Yeah, happy to, thanks. So in group three, we had presentations from the Global Dairy Platform on their dairy sustainability framework, highlighting some of the GLEAM models that have just been published or shared. Um, we had the Jamil Observatory presentation on their work on food security and early action. We had a presentation on enhancing data culture in animal sciences in Sub-Saharan Africa. And then we had a presentation from the ILRI team on their GLAD project around livestock advocacy. And so sort of vastly different perceptions of sort of what is, how data supports that work and who the users are for the outputs of, of those types of programs. Um, and I think one of the things that came up pretty quickly in, in our session was sort of the challenges around how you analyze data to accurately reflect the diversity within the livestock sector. Um, and, and this came about during the dairy presentations where obviously you can imagine there's quite a wide swath of typologies of, of production systems um, and sort of what the results produced through something like Gleam can mean to different folks along that, along that system. And so sort of how do we reconcile what those results might look like or, or what story they might tell on behalf of sort of pastoral communities versus sort of large scale dairy, dairy production. And so really trying to think about how those stories are presented in a way that doesn't ultimately leave someone as the villain, but really shows how on behalf of an entire sector, what the right solutions might be depending on where you're working. Um, we also talked a lot about understanding who the evidence is intended to help make decisions. Um, and so I think we did get a, a fair bit of, of good answers to our first question about who are the main decision makers. And each of the groups that presented seemed to have a clear vision of who they were working for or who they were ultimately trying to help make decisions. Um, but the point was raised sort of when you're talking about helping farmers in the field make a decision, it's a lot 
different than helping national entities decide about resource allocation. And so how do you build tools that, that could potentially meet both of those or sort of the wide variety of needs across that spectrum? Um, or is it better to focus in um, and sort of how each of each of those decision maker sets has a role to play in helping the sustainability of the livestock sector. Um, we talked about thinking about the future and I, I personally thought this was really interesting and we had a presentation about sort of data culture um, in Nigeria and sort of how do we start within the educational system to help support up and coming um, sort of colleagues in the field to really learn to build in evidence-based decision making and help sort of turn the tide of sort of previously and historically analog decision-making practices into sort of more data-driven approaches um, and sort of the, the need for that. So I, I really appreciated the, the sort of forward-looking component of that presentation. Um, and then in sort of trying to get to some of the questions, I think we also touched on, particularly through the Jamil Observatory work, really trying to map out the stakeholders of who all is engaged in some of these areas that have historic effort and engagement and to really try and map what the needs are and how these new and innovative solutions can help address those needs. So I think we had a pretty wide ranging conversation, um, but it was, it was great to see sort of the common threads between the, the, four, the four topics and then those who had some good questions. So thanks and hopefully that reflected it for, for other folks as well. Great, thank you very much, Shannon. I think you had probably the most diverse group of presentations in your group um, and therefore, a huge amount to reflect on um, and, and just just picking up on one of the points you made um, about you know education in the future reminded me of you know 30 odd years back when no vet knew anything about economics and that was something that had to be built into the community and the culture over time and I'm now looking at some really wonderful vets who have been converted to the cause so uh, <laughs> maybe we maybe we need to build a data culture into our animal science and veterinary training, and maybe that's already been done or not. Okay, so um, we thank you very much indeed again for all the presenters, for everybody who's contributed to the conversation, and and also to our reflectors and feeders back. And we have about one minute to go, so I'm just going to say one thing that has come out of I think all of these groups is that. LD4D has been trying to figure out, or the Secretariat and the Steering Committee have been trying to figure out what to do about working groups. We used to have working groups and they kind of have over time become moribund and most of them do. And we we realize that that's partly because a working group can be kind of a project. You know, you have a thing to do, you do it, you finish it. But in fact, what we really have in LD4D or what we maybe need more rather than working groups per se, is little communities of practice within the bigger community that, that get together to discuss specific things and take them forward. So one of the things that emerged from group two, for example, was definitions, you know, making sure that we are clear and consistent about the definitions we use, not that they all have to be the same, you know, and your hands have to be tied, but that we're very clear about the the definitions we use and how we um, communicate them to people. And then there was um, something that Isabel mentioned, I think about, you know, would it be useful to have a group that all discusses animal health apps and learns from each other? So perhaps something we can think about as we go forward is what communities of practice would be most useful to facilitate online that wouldn't necessarily need a huge amount of money or people's time but would just provide that sharing space to help things to move. Anyway, that's just my final thought into all of this. Great, and Shirley has just made the point, thank you Shirley, that such communities of practice would bring their expertise to share with the wider community across LD, 4D and other areas such as Gazel, in which Shirley I know have a great interest. So. A, a very good point. Um, great, and we now have a, a chance to go straight into Menti and put your ideas in about which sub-communities of practice might be useful. So this, the link is the same as the previous uh, mentees. I'll copy it into the chat again and just take a moment if you have any suggestions, or you can enter those there. I've pasted the link in the chat.
Great. I see, Mark, you've just posted something in the chat, which I hope you've now had a chance to put into Menti. I'm just scrolling. So we see we've got lots of submissions. So I think we, we won't have time to process this uh, on the fly, but we will reflect on these and report back to everyone. Yeah. I think there's some really great and one of the things we can do in our next steering committee meeting is to have a look and see which of these communities of practice it might be practical to take forward, you know, fairly soon, or where they might already be starting to exist in other spaces that we can just point people to them. There's also a bit of um, overlap between a few of them, so that's quite nice to see if there's um, themes coming up time and time again, we can start building on um, the most popular groups. Right. Karen, I'm going to hand back to you now because you're going to be taking us on into the next session, aren't you? Yes, indeed. So um, I think we need to put up the slides again, Gareth, and we'll move into the wrap up. So thanks everyone for your contributions and um, your ideas for working groups. I've, sort of fits pretty well with this uh, next section, which is sort of the forward look to 2022. So um, we're going to take the comments that we received today and we're going to uh, review them and um, areas that we can develop in 2022, your suggestions. We will try, try to move forward with those. But I just wanted to give you a little flavor of what's coming up next year. Um, we're starting to work on plans for communication and activities. But um, we've identified a couple of um, more meaty areas that we're working on um, that we'll interact with you guys on over the next year. The first of which is the SABI Livestock Strategy Strategic Review. Um, this is, um, as, as uh, Vanessa said at the outset, SEBI is the Secretariat for LD4D. Um, and we really want to make sure that we sharpen our offering to the community. We represent your needs. So we're going to um, circulate a questionnaire quite, sh quite soon, which will try and assess um, how we're doing, what we need to do more of, and that sort of thing. Another area um, that we hope to work on in uh, early next year is understanding drivers of productivity and the role of data in supporting these. Um, we hope to commission that at the start of the year, so that should provide us with really nice insight there's two other areas that we'd like to cover in this final se section before we hand back to Andrew, and that's the decision makers data needs assessment um, and gender and livestock. So there are two other um, quite significant areas of work, and I'd like to hand over to Cara Vance now to take you through those. So thanks, Cara. All right. Thank you, Karen. Okay. Thanks, Gareth. OK, so, yeah, I want to tell you about two major activities that we already have planned for 2022, which we believe will really help drive the direction of our community activities and outputs and potentially even um, these new sub communities. So the first major activity we have planned is a decision maker data needs assessment. And you'll have seen from today, actually, the running theme seems to have been you know, who, who is our end user? Who's our data for? Which decision makers, you know, are we hitting? And if you remember back to Annie's theory of change presentation at the start of our meeting, one of the major outcomes was that decision makers have access to relevant and reliable data to guide their decisions. But in order for us to achieve that, we need to understand the role that data and evidence plays in decision making and the livestock data challenges facing decision makers and also, crucially, who are the decision makers that LD4D can support? So for those that have been with us for a few years now, you'll know that we had already started trying to answer some of these questions. And today I'm very pleased to announce that we have commissioned the Basara Centre to build on the work that has been started. So the Basara team will perform a livestock decision maker needs assessment on our behalf with three main outputs from that work, which are on the slide in front of you. So they will produce a landscape map of livestock decision maker groupings and the kinds of decisions they make that require data and evidence. They will provide a report on data and evidence priorities for each decision maker group, and they will identify existing barriers and gaps in accessing data and evidence. So I'm really pleased to say that we've got a few members of the Basara team with us today, 
And I'm now going to pass over to Wairimu Musiki to introduce herself and Busara and say a few words about the work they're going to be doing. So Wairimu, if you're there, I'll pass over to you to unmute and say hi. Thank you, Clara. Thank you very much. Uh, as mentioned, I'm Wairimu Muthika. I'm an engagement director at Busara Center for Behavioral, uh, for, for Behavioral Science. And um, Busara is a research firm dedicated to advancing and applying behavior science in the global south. We are headquartered in Kenya with offices in Nigeria, Tanzania, Ethiopia, Uganda, and India. Past the mapping of the decision Nika Kara has mentioned, we believe it is important to appreciate that the, their demand and subsequent use of specific knowledge material is influenced by both structural factors, for, in, for instance, access to, to that data source of to the data sources, and also behavioral factors like the motivation for using a particular source of, uh, of, of data versus another. And another example you could look look at is uh, we do have preference over the formats in which we consume and retain uh, information and especially data. So the proposed study is structured as a collaborative effort with the insights aimed specifically at contributing to the LD4D objective of driving better livestock decision making in lower middle income countries. Thank you, Cara. Yeah, thanks very much. So just quickly, what does this mean for LD4D? So we don't anticipate that this work will require too much um, member input, but the Basara team might want to reach out to a few members, and we would be really grateful to those that could spare some time for that. And finally, we very much hope that the outputs from this work will help steer and guide the future direction of our community activities and outputs so that we can all better support decision makers in low and middle income countries. Okay, uh, next slide. Thank you very much. So. The second of our main activities plan for 2022 is driving forward community conversations on gender and livestock data. And I was really pleased to see that um, gender and livestock came up as one of the suggestions for a sub community of practice. So as many of you are aware, livestock are considered a key entry point for women's empowerment and food and nutrition security. And in order to guide decision-making and policies and investments in livestock that will empower women and improve nutrition, it's important that we first understand the gender differences and how women and men access, own, manage and control income from livestock. But in order to understand those gender differences, we first need to collect the data and information. And that means collecting gender disaggregated data, quantitative data, as well as thick data in the form of uh, stories and experience from the people themselves. And it is this area we want to explore further within our community in the coming year. So we wanna ask what gender and livestock data are people collecting? What indicators are they monitoring and how are they measuring it? Um, I'm really pleased to say that we have the full support from our LD for D funders, the Bill and Melinda Gates livestock team on this. They realize the importance of gender and livestock data in driving women's empowerment and are funding the LD for D secretariat to ensure this is a priority topic for the community going forward. Um, in order to help um, develop and drive the LD for D strategy, and activities. I'm really happy to say that we've commissioned gender and livestock expert Beth Miller to work with us on this. So Beth is with us today and I know we are almost well are over time but Beth I'd just like to pass over you to say a few words of hello and what this work means to you. Okay great thank you so much Kara. Um, I'm uh, Beth Miller and I've been working in the livestock uh, sector for a very long time, uh, mostly in dairy, but uh, uh, recently as the uh, president of the International Goat Association, which is how I know a lot of you here. And um, I'm just thrilled that the L4, uh, LD4D for for LD community exists because this is a thrilling platform for having in-depth discussions. So I look forward to talking with you all more. Thank you. Thanks, Beth. Yeah, it's a mouthful. You'll get used to saying it after a while, LD for D. Oh my. <laughs> anyway, so thank you. So quickly, what does this mean for LD for D and our members? Well, we've already had conversations with some of our community members on how they incorporate gender into their livestock projects and businesses. And now what we want to do is open up that conversation to the whole community. 
And we believe that by sharing our experience and stories, we can learn from each other and identify best practices in collecting and analyzing gender and livestock data and information. So with that in mind, one of the first activities we're planning next year is a community conversation on gender and livestock data around the theme of, as I have on the screen here, what do you monitor and how do you measure it? So Beth and Annie are going to organize events and run this for us in the second quarter of 2022. And we would be delighted to have as many of you participate as possible. And we will send around more details on that really shortly. So that was a whistle stop um, tour of some of the activities for next year. I'm now going to pass over to Andrew Fiston, who is going to say a few final words, I think. Yes. Hi, everybody. So um, I'll be brief, as I know people have to run, but uh, what a wonderful meeting, uh, packed with a very rich, detailed conversation, tremendous diversity in the topics, the presenters and participants. It presents a challenge for our community, but to, to how do we focus in on this? And I'm really looking forward to various interventions next year that are going to help us to focus in in certain areas. Um, I think what came through for me was that, um, that we have a lot of livestock champions here. I learned a new word, the livestock lonely. I hope nobody on this call feels like they're part of the livestock lonely. This is clearly a need for this network. We could have gone another hour at least. Um, and I, you know, I congratulate our colleagues at SEBI for putting this meeting together and for all the presenters and contributors for keeping this such a vibrant and active meeting. Uh, I'd like to thank our Gates Foundation colleagues as well uh, for having the foresight to create this space for allow us to collaborate. We've heard that coordination is a key function for this group. And I think that that's, that's underscored in the comments today. We've also heard a lot about decision makers. Start with the end in mind. What are we trying to change here? What positive aspects are we trying to improve? So there's a tremendous amount. Livestock's been under pressure. It's been a difficult year, but I look forward to this community taking forward some of the solutions, make livestock part of the solutions to the challenges that are being put out there. Can I encourage you, if you've enjoyed this meeting, if you think there's a value here, could you encourage your colleagues to join? We're strong, we're 500 strong already. Can we reach more than that? I think there are many people that could benefit from this group that are perhaps not yet members. Keep in touch, this is a community of practice. We are the strength of our interactions not the individuals, we can collectively achieve a great, great deal of things here. So please keep the collaboration. Reach out to our colleagues in SEBI, to those people on the steering committee you may, may know, reach out to me. We wanna know what you want and how to do this better. Please take a moment if you can to complete some of the surveys that we've put out there. And I'm really excited to look forward to some of those innovations and, and activities that were coming up in the next few months that will really help us to frame the direction that we're taking. And with that, I'd like to just wish everybody season's greetings um, for your family and yourselves and look forward to staying connected in 2022. Um, and I don't know, am I handing back to uh, our colleagues in SEBI for one? Yeah. For our... Great, over to you, Vanessa. Thank you so much, Andrew, and for all of your efforts this year. Um, before we go, we want to take a group photo. So if you are keen to show your face, please turn your video on and wave to the camera. Okay, I'll count to three, all right? One, two, three. So this will appear on the recording, hopefully. Um, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> but thank you all so much for, for sticking with us. I know we went a bit over time. Uh, we will prepare a meeting wrap up and get that to you uh, next week. Uh, and that'll go out to everyone, not only people who attended, but the whole community. So if anyone missed out, hopefully they can uh, follow what has gone on. So with that, thanks again. We are really grateful for your participation and have a nice rest of your day. Bye.